Hello, Mehdi. Hello, Kevin. What a bet better introduction for your yeah, talk. Yeah, I laughed a lot. It was very funny. Yeah, yeah, cloudy well, data and hack my growth, right? Exactly, yeah. and rest in peace, too. Yeah, it <laughs> and was the really rest. Fun. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Kevin, for being here with us. Uh, you know, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you to have you here. Uh, you are you are one of the thought leaders on the uh, let's say how platform think and work and all the models the models that actually they use to accumulate value. Right? You are uh, the the author of the um, uh, of the study Gaphanomics uh, when you were working uh, at a previous uh, uh, agency. And so yes, yeah, so nobody better than you understand these models. And actually, you prepared something for us today, right? I did. I did. I did. Uh, yeah, and so I, I will be happy to present it. Yeah, please have a please share your slide, share your screen, and let's right? go and, and enjoy this time with us today. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Medi. Uh, no problem. Again, if you have any question, if you have any question, you can type them in the chat, uh, right? And let's hear uh, Kevin for in the name of performance, information, and entrepreneurship. Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Medi. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be uh, to be to be with you today. Let me close the chat for a second because it kind of disturbs me. Um, so I'm really glad to be opening this uh, this third day of API Days. Uh, my name is Kevin Eshwagi. As Mehdi uh, hinted, I used to work for a company called Faber Novel, where I was in charge of uh, the Gaphanomics studies, which analyzed uh, the models of the digital giants. Uh, and I left Faber Novel a few years ago to start a think tank that go by the name of uh, Heretic. Uh, and at Heretic, what we do is that we imagine, we craft, and we share digital uh, alternatives. So we do that with different types of activities. Uh, just quick, we do some research, we do some consulting and training for large corporations, we do some education, uh, we teach at Sciences Po, at Ponts et Chaussées, and we develop uh, digital services like applications, also objects, and we are currently also working on a uh, cartoon about um, algorithms. So a bunch of stuff, but all come to the same thing, which is trying to talk and spread digital alternatives. So what do we mean by digital alternatives? We basically mean anything that is uh, deviant from digital standards. And these digital standards are what have been crafted by the tech giants, uh, all uh, in the US, in California, and that have spread all over the world. So. They have spread either through these uh, original actors, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and their children like Uber, Airbnb, and all these guys, or they have been uh, copied uh, in different markets uh, all around the world. And the question uh, that always interested me was, what do these actors have in common? So I looked a lot about their business model, and I wanted to enlarge uh, the picture and, and look at it from a broader perspective. And I found 10, uh, 10 things that I wanted to share with you that to me are uh, structural to these different type of actors. So the first thing is that these actors all believe in changing the world through technical innovation. Uh, Larry Page tells us, Sergey and I founded Google because we're super optimistic about the potential for technology to make the world a better place. Um, the way to do that is by connecting, digitizing, modelizing, and automating everything and everyone that is possible. So you can find it in their mission statement, and you can find it in the different products they put out uh, that seek to automate uh, thinking, deciding, and acting. They build tools to solve problems for consumers and producers. You've all heard this sentence uh, that has been repeated to us many, many times, what problems are you trying to solve? So there's really, really focus on this, uh, on this question. The tools they built actually provide essentially comfort, predictability, volume, and efficiency. If you look at the Google Maps, what it tells you is not the most beautiful itinerary, not the, the one you don't know, not, not something you want to discover. It's just the most efficient from point A to point B, the most quick. They structure marketplaces to connect consumers to producers. Demand supply, what they do is uh, being the intermediary and matching them. And how do, do, uh, how do they do money with this, uh, uh, this structure? Basically, they exploit humans as resources to generate profits. So they try to extract our data, our attention, our time, our skills, our competencies, our knowledge, um, 
in order to feed uh, their systems and generate profits with it. Strategy-wise, what are they aiming at? They strive to conquer the world. So Peter Thiel tells us if you're a startup, you want to get to a monopoly. Um, so there's really this, this will to conquer the whole world and to engage in some kind of battle royale uh, uh, where the last man standing will win. Doing that, they prioritize their vision and their selfish interest over the common good, and that's why they don't abide by the different laws of the, pay, in the, the different countries they operate in, uh, be it tax laws, be it labor laws, competition law, all these things. They don't really care if, if it impedes their vision, uh, they will go forward. And their vision actually uh, is the reason why they sacrifice the present and the past to the future. They don't really care about what was before them. They don't really care about what's happening with their solutions because they're really hopeful about what will happen later with their different services, products. Uh, and they say, now uh, it seems that there are some problems, but our grand vision will solve all these problems. And that's what makes uh, some, someone like Jeff Bezos say, often invention requires a long-term willingness to be misunderstood. So Jeff, uh, we criticize Jeff uh, because we don't understand him, not because he's doing something that is reprehensible. And the last thing is that they ignore cultural and territorial di diversity. They do uh, one size fits all product. And so you can be in New York, you can be in Paris, you can be in Delhi, you can be anywhere in the world. Your Google Maps will look the same, will have the same features, same for Uber, same for Airbnb. So there's really uh, a, a uniformization of uh, the practices and services. and no real taking into account of the culture uh, or the history of the places they enter. So this is what uh, we call the, the playbook, the GAFA playbook. And if we wanted to sum it up, uh, we can say oh, the last one is XXX. Uh, but the, the first two ones, uh, we can say that these actors are obsessive. Um, let me look. I heard a, a notification. Maybe someone is talking to me. Direct message. All right, it's something else. Um, so they're obsessive. Uh, they, they want digital technologies everywhere at the maximum of performance. Uh, the second thing is that they're reductionists. So they only care about solving problems, uh, about um, uh, solving problems for consumers and to add performance and, um, and um, uh, to add performance and efficiency. Well, the notifications really disturb me. Uh, the third thing is that they are extractive, so they structure marketplaces and they try to extract value from human beings. Uh, they're imperialistic, uh, so they try to conquer the world and, and break the laws if it's, if it's needed. And they're soilless, so they sacrifice the present and the past to the future and also the culture. All right, and so this is the Gaffan playbook. The problem is, to me, that this playbook has been copy-pasted all over the world uh, by all types of actors. If I take here in France, uh, it's been copy-pasted in companies and universities. Everyone is um, pushed to be copying the model of these actors, and it's being taught at universities. And even at the core of the state, our president says he wants to, us to be a startup nation. So this playbook kind of is... is is penetrating all the different fields of our economy and society. The problem is that on many aspects, uh, this model is a failure, at least for us Europeans. So I don't know how many of you are Europeans in, at this conference, but, um, uh, but I guess uh, more than uh, on other API Days conferences. And for us, it is an economic failure, a clear economic failure. So the, the market cap of the GAFAM is four times the market cap of the CAC 40. Um, and uh, we don't have that many unicorns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the failure is, is grandiose. It's also a political failure. Uh, if you look at Uber uh, and, and uh, its uh, labor model, it goes completely at the opposite of what we decided as a society 70 years ago uh, when we had our fifth uh, republic uh, uh, instigated. Uh, and so the model they are propagating is really against our political values. It's a societal failure. I won't go over all the psychic problems, all the democratic problems, the fake news, um, everything addictive problem, all the things that, that makes our uh, society uh, operative are, are being challenged. And finally, but not least, uh, it's an ecological failure. Uh, it's already, digital technology is already 3% of our energy consumption uh, worldwide, and it's growing by the day. 
And the thing is, these failures are inherent to the playbook. If you have actors that want to conquer the world and establish monopolies, they will take all the cake and they will leave nothing for us. And so it will be an economic failure. If you have actors that decide that laws aren't to be obeyed, you will have uh, uh, your political framework, framework being challenged. Uh, if you try to extract value and attention and time from people, you will create the societal failures. If you try to put digital everywhere, uh, and with more performance and more use cases all the time, you will have an ecological failure. So the failures are inherent to the playbook. And the question that really struck me is, why are we doing the same thing over and over again? And why are we applying the same framework all over again when we clearly see that it doesn't work, when we clearly see that it has some major uh, lacks uh, that, that makes it kind of uh, non-desirable for societies. And the answer we have at Eretic is basically that we have faith. We have faith in this model. Uh, and uh, these 10 uh, items that I presented you as a playbook to us are really commandments uh, of something we call sacred tech. Uh, and they are really commandments to technology, the world who shall change everything and everyone who shall connect, digitize, modelize, and automate. You get the point. Uh, but it's really commandments that we obey without really being able to question them. And I'll try to, to show to you that this metaphor uh, is kind of standing. So uh, I'm not, it's not a conspiracy theory. Uh, it's just a, a, a metaphor and a way to look at it. But it kind of makes sense uh, when you try to gather different uh, proofs. The first thing is that commandments exist for real. There is this thing called Facebook's Little Red Book. I don't know if you heard about it. That was published by Facebook in 2015. Um, and in, and that was distributed to, to, uh, to a bunch of employees. And inside you have uh, some commandments. So Facebook was not originally created to be a company. It was built to accomplish a social mission, make the world more open and connected. So this is the second commandment, everything you should connect, digitize, modernize, and automate. Changing how people communicate will always change the world. To technology, the world you shall change. This one is, is striking. The quick shall inherit the earth. So through entrepreneurship, the world you shall concur. So, and you have, you have 10 more commandments uh, that are available on the internet. And uh, you have also some commandments that, that we know that are not in this book, like move fast and break things, which is nothing more than don't respect the rules and just go forward. You also have prophecies and prophets. Uh, when Mark Andreessen tells us software is eating the world, it's nothing more than a prophecy. And well, Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, tells us Google is leaving a few years in the future and sends the rest of his messages. Is nothing. He's, he's, he's saying that uh, Google is a prophet and he knows the future and, and he's telling it to us. You have gospels. Uh, Jesus is born in a stable and all startups are born in garages. So we built history, we built some, uh, uh, we create gospels uh, about our startups and our technologies. Another gospel is Ellen, what we call Ellen's Ark. Uh, when you look, look at what Ellen must say, if there's a third world war, we want to make sure there's enough seeds of human civilization elsewhere on Mars to bring it back and shorten the the length of the dark ages. So this is nothing more than the Noah's Ark, but uh, 2020s version. We also have masses. Uh, when So I have a turtleneck too, but when you looked at uh, Steve Jobs and his turtleneck and his big white apple behind, always dressed the same way. It's nothing more than a mass. And we have pilgrimages. Uh, when you go on a learning expedition to discover Silicon Valley, and uh, it's nothing more than a pilgrimage. And if you haven't done this pilgrimage and you're, you're a leader at a company, you're, you're a bad believer. And it even goes to deification of technology, uh, be it through singularity or the simulation theory that basically puts machines above us. And this is not something uh, that is uh, coincident. Uh, there are two people, at least that I know, but probably more, that have theorized uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, religious approach you know, to business. So the first is on the right, it's Guy Kawasaki, which was the chief marketing officer at Apple uh, for a while. And he published a book called The Macintosh Way. And in it, you have a full uh, chapter uh, that is dedicated to a good evangelism program. And now. Uh, you see, he's the the term we say a tech evangelist uh, actually comes from from these writings, and 
More recently, you have Douglas Atkin, which is the VP community of Airbnb, which is kind of saying the VP car of uh, Mercedes, uh, that wrote a book called The Culting of Brands, uh, and where he teaches uh, companies how they can leverage the methods of religious cults uh, to build true believers to their to their brand. So this comparison is is done, and the leverage of uh, the religious uh, methodology is being uh, uh, is being used. And I will, I will let Eric Schmidt have the final word on this metaphor. He says, there's a particular religion that we all represent, and it goes something like this. If you take a large number of people and you empower them with communication tools and opportunities to be created, society gets better. The combination of empowerment, innovation, and creativity will be our solution. But that is a religion in of itself. So we have this metaphor. We have this playbook that we know is uh, not producing the results that we we are seeking uh, and we have this metaphor the religious metaphor um, uh, that has kind of convinced us this religious discourse that has convinced us and made us stop asking questions and just apply the playbook over and over again so what we should do is basically stop believing uh, none of these things uh, are compulsory. We're not forced uh, to try to change the world through technology. We're not forced to connect everything. We're not forced to create marketplaces. There are other things we can do. And one way to convince yourself of that, and unfortunately, I don't have the time today to go over it. I would have loved to, uh, is to, to try to dig into why uh, where does this playbook come from? And there are multiple types of ideologies. You have cybernetics, uh, which was a dream of connecting all humanity in a big network with uh, machines. You have objectivism, Ayn Rand, uh, which is the morality of selfishness. Uh, this woman believes altruism is a sacrifice of man to man, uh, and she is the main promoter of the entrepreneur uh, figure. You have creative destruction. You have the front, the meat frontier. Uh, so you have a bunch of ideologies and clearly you can see that this playbook is not a revealed truth. Uh, it's just a perspective. It's just uh, from some ideologies and it, it just came out of some human's brain. And so we can replace it with other things that came from other humans' brains. We have multiple types of ideologies. This is a beautiful work that I love from Studio Carreras where he, he took a bunch of ideologies and, and tried to illustrate them. So this is... At, not even a fourth of all the ideologies he pictured, but we can try to apply all these ideologies to digital, see what it means. And the, the, the thing is, digital technologies are a material we can craft. Uh, that is my main point. And so for the past 30 years, uh, it's like we've been crafting arrows and bows, and now we need to start crafting violins and chess boards. Uh, it, it's, so it's like the wood we've been stuck in doing over and over the same thing, and now we need to open again and try uh, other things. Uh, and so what we need to do is challenge this playbook, uh, challenge all these its components. And so, for example, we can go from being imperialistic to diplomatic. Uh, and we have that already a lot with open source and platform cooperativism, uh, which are ways to distribute power, um, to create transparency, to limit autocracy. Um, and we also have regulation. Now Facebook is being challenged uh, in the US for the acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram. So it's being challenged on its imperialism uh, perspective. The second thing, going from extractive to protective, so stop trying to extract things from users, but trying to preserve users, uh, give them protection. Uh, that's what ProtoMail does, for example. So you pay five bucks a month, uh, but we don't take uh, your data, we don't read your emails, etc., etc. And you have multiple examples. You have Signal, you have uh, you have so many uh, browsers and and, uh, and search tools. And also on here, you have regulation. Uh, uh, GDPR is an example of a regulation that, that seeks to move from extractive to protective. But the three others, the fact that they are soilless, so they don't care about time and space, they are in their own minds, they are reductionist and they are obsessive, this is not challenged enough. And this is what I want to emphasize, and this is what we're, we're trying to work on. Soilless 
stopping being soulless means starting being rooted. Uh, and rooted is stop building tools that are one for all and are one size fits all and are grounded in a territory, grounded in a community, respecting a tradition, adapted to a way of life. And obviously, if you do that, you're going to reduce your your potential market, but that, that goes to your imperialistic bias. Why do you need to build something that is used by a billion users uh, if you can build something multiple things that each of uh, them are used by 100,000 people. What's the problem with that? There is no re real problem with that. It's just that we decided uh, that we, we needed to control the whole world. And maybe you will tell me it's because of the business model that works at scale, but the business model that works at scale is the extractive business model. If you find other business models, uh, it may work for way smaller pool of customers. Moving from reductionist uh, to rich, so trying to be rich, it means stop solving problems. There are other things we can do, we can reinstate a practice, we can develop a skill, we can defend the right, provoke an emotion, enrich a culture, uphold a value, realize a dream, rekindle a memory. There are the, the, our vocabulary is rich uh, and we should be using this rich vocabulary to get ideas. Uh, to create new motivations, to create new objectives, because solving problems is just a little, little part of all the things that humans do in their daily lives and all the things humans love in their daily lives. We can also stop looking just at the consumer. We can start looking at the other types of profile, the citizen, the child, the romantic, the artist, the explorer, the worker, the timid, the joker. All these types of cu customers are humans and all have uh, specificities that can be addressed uh, with uh, a tool or a product and a service that just doesn't solve the, their problem, but actually uh, helps them be uh, what they want to be in this world. And the third thing, it, we, we can stop focusing only on products that provide comfort, predictability, performance, or efficiency, or volume. Uh, what about products that promote intuition, empathy, boredom, uh, playfulness, sensuality, responsibility, friendship, humor, all these things. Again, we have a rich vocabulary. We can use all that to get ideas. And the last thing is stop being obsessive and start getting relevant. We don't need to put digital technologies everywhere at the maximum of performance with 100% accessibility all the time, uh, etc. So. Instead of connecting, digitizing, modelizing, automating everything, we can connect less, we can uh, provide less information, modelize less, less calculation, and automate less. Leave more things to be done by humans and, and not try to import everything to the machines. And so this can be really theor theoretical, so that's why I wanted to present you one of our projects that kind of, to me, illustrates uh, what I'm trying to, to, to tell you today. And this project is called Derive. Uh, and Derive is a navigation app, uh, basically. And it goes on the premises of actually being rooted and not soilless. Because when you look at Google Maps, uh, uh, it's, an, it's an app that has been created for uh, American cities uh, that are orthogonal in their urbanism, that ha are very long, very long blocks, uh, made for cars uh, with very long distance, and often there isn't uh, a city center. So naturally, you want to go from point A to point B uh, uh, by the shortest itinerary, um, and you, you, and usually at, uh, with cars. So New York is an example, but you have a lot of American, other American cities that are uh, more appropriate for the example. When you look at Paris, uh, it's an urbanism that is completely different. Uh, you have uh, streets that are small and scary, and other things that are small and charming. You have monuments. You have uh, big avenues with cars. Some are polluted. Uh, you have the Seine. You have green spaces. So it's really chaotic. And so the way you move into chaos is not by optimizing. It's by uh, following your intuition uh, and trying to discover. And this is actually a cultural practice that we, we've been we've had for centuries, which we called flannery. Uh, flannery is this ability to, to wander without a purpose in the city, just to discover for the pleasure of living in your city. And Victor Hugo uh, tells wandering is human, flannery is Parisian. So it's really something that is anchored in our, in our culture. Uh, 
And this is totally the opposite of what Google has to say about uh, walking around. They, the Michael Jones, which is the chief technology advocate of Google, the ex, uh, says if you have a mobile phone with Google Maps, you can go anywhere on the planet and have confidence that we can give you directions to get to where you want to go safely and easily. No human ever has to feel lost again. So this is this goes completely against our uh, worshipping and our love of flanning. We, we love to get lost. And so that's why we, cr we created an app, uh, not to solve a problem, but to reinstate a practice, which is la flannerie. And so we built uh, Derive, which is a really simple app. Uh, you are point A, you are in the Republic, you want to go to Châtelet, somewhere else. It just, like a compass, gives you the direction and the distance uh, for you to go to your, uh, to your direction. So uh, you're sure you will arrive, but at each intersection, you can choose yourself uh, if you're going to go right or left, if you know the street and you want to take it again, or if you don't know it and you want to explore it. Uh, and so we reduced the volume of information, we reduced the volume of modelization, there's no calculation, and we reduced automation. Uh, you think by yourself uh, and, and you choose your way. Once we had that, we wanted to go further and then look at the emotion side. So we instead of practice, now we wanted to provoke an emotion and spark surprise. So we created uh, the secret derive. So you want to send one of your friends somewhere, you want to share uh, a place with him, you send him a derive and you hide the address. Uh, and so he will just have the compass, the direction, uh, the distance, but you won't know where you're taking him. So this creates this creates surprise and mystery, uh, and also confidence because now I can't go on Google Maps and look at the ratings. Uh, I have to go on there to see if I actually like it or not. And this is something really important to me because it's something we've been able to do for uh, decades. Uh, it's simple technology, but we haven't done it. We, it's the first time we can send someone somewhere without, without telling him where he's going, but we haven't done it because we've been so focused on transparency and efficiency that we missed all these other use cases that we can imagine. And the third thing we wanted to do is actually encourage uh, adventure, uh, saying you can have adventures every day uh, put yourself at risk a little bit and have fun with it. And so we started creating playlists um, that that are basically a database of uh, places and that we put online on their name. So here is 99 Cantine. And 99 Cantine, you just go and, and you, you click on go uh, and through an API, actually, it will bring you on the app and get you to a random restaurant that is cheap uh, and delicious close to you. Uh, and you won't, again, know uh, what is the restaurant, you'll have to go to Discover. So this is a, 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 an interesting way to create adventure. You want to go to lunch, you can have an adventure going to lunch just because we reduce the volume of information and we randomize instead of personalizing. And this is actually the way we make money. We create playlists for uh, different partners, uh, be it cities or uh, media, etc., cetera, et cetera. So at the end, we end up with an app that is uh, that is um, tailored for for humans uh, that exploits our uh, intuition, our sense of orientation, uh, that prom promotes different types of emotions, etc. We end up with an app that is uh, focusing on locality, uh, locality on on the way you move because it's not for two hundred miles, uh, but also because it's a cultural practice, a French cultural practice, and we can export it elsewhere. Uh, we, it can be used in other countries, but it will be a French application, culturally French, not just capitalistically. It's also an app that focuses on privacy because, because we don't need to do any calculation, we don't need any of your data. So it, there's no question that we won't uh, take your data. It's 100% private. And also, it's more environmental respectful uh, because, again, because we don't need data, we don't need to calculate, we don't need to run servers, et cetera, et cetera. So we reduce, at least for ourselves, or we don't augment uh, the quantity of uh, energy that is consumed. So again, uh, if I wanted to, to uh, give you an insight today is that digital technologies are a material we can craft. Uh, the future is completely open uh, and uh, there are many things we can do and it's time, now has come the time to explore again. Regulation is redrawing the playing field, uh, opening space again, um, 
for competition against the major actors. And the question is, what do we want to do with this competition? Do we want to reproduce exactly the same models that are kind of destructive socially, politically, economically, um, ecologically, or do we want to build our own models? Uh, and I think uh, we should be seeking to explore our own models, and that's the only way we can find uh, our, our spot uh, in this digital economy as Europeans. And so we need to try to find uh, digital services and products that are not imperialistic but diplomatic, that are not extractive but protective, that are not soilless but are rooted, that are not reductionist but are rich, and that are not obsessive but are relevant and are use digital technologies only when it's really needed and really when it makes more sense than leaving it to a human. Basically, we all need to become heretical uh, to the dogma, uh, and I would be really happy uh, to be able to talk to some of you. Uh, some of you sent messages, these are the notifications, uh, about what we're doing and about how it can fit with what you, you are doing yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin, for uh, uh, this, this this amazing presentation. Of course, uh, we have uh, eight minutes for questions. The, the first one I will uh, I will ask you. It's uh, yeah. Already some people say Marcus like amazing talk, Kevin and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's before talking about you know the solution. You know, talk, let's talk about your your assumption. So it seems that you know like let's say the, this you know, the innovation how it's been built the tech innovation digital innovation is like a religion right this is yeah. why you have your title like amen at the end right and let's say you know uh, when nietzsche uh, nietzsche i don't know it's in english but uh, said god is dead right he said we went from salvation looking for salvation to look for happiness right so the value of god are of religion are dead now we will have new values look for in ha human happiness like and so it seems that, yeah, and in the same era, we've seen many new political doctrines like coming, like we've seen a, a socialism or communism or, or other uh, anar anarchy and other stuff like that, no coming. And some people even consider that they were kind of new religion without a God, right? Mm -hmm. You know, almost the kind of same values, sharing, you know, with good and people, but at the end. So my question is, there is this at least company or models who have kind of a religion of what they think uh, uh, the future should be there at least they have a project for us uh, uh, do we need to invent a new one or can we do can be an can we be an heretic right and can we be an atheist in this tech um it's uh I, I don't have a definitive answer what i can say is the answer for ourselves uh, our collective is that we say we don't want to uh, we want to develop heterodoxies so we want to explore again we don't know exactly what should be be done but we just know that this model unique model is something that has to be challenged and we need to open new doors we need to develop new ways uh, new types of vision new types of discourse new types of products and services and at the end of the road maybe uh, we will develop again a new religion, uh, a new way uh, of doing it. And some people will start believing what we say, thinking it's a revealed truth because they didn't do the research to know why did we think all that. And then at this time, a new collective that is called Heretic 2.0 will come back and challenge us again and say, no, guys, you're stupid. You didn't see this and that and that. And they will develop something again. So the whole point is just being more than an atheist, being an agnostic and saying, this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting. I may believe this and this, but uh, I can always challenge, which is basically also these guys uh, promote themselves as being uh, uh, fans of science, but science is the art of being able to challenge everything all the time and don't take it anything for granted and know that everything is based on hypothesis. And if you change the hypothesis, then you change the results. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I I, I say that uh, uh, one time that you know uh, will come an, a, a new hippie movement, but we where drugs will be replaced by tech, right? <laughs> so, but <laughs> it's an international movement of people wanting uh, something better. Uh, I also have a question for you, Etienne Klein. You know the 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 the, uh, the scientist and philosopher, and he also an, an alpinist. He climbed mountains, right? Yeah. Uh, and he say that 
in the 60s, 70s, we always had this idea of the future, right? We had a future we could hope in, right? That would be better. We, we could have progress in it, right? But he said now, and the future was the year 2000. The year 2000 was this future we all we would climb, right? But yeah. now the year 2000 has come. We didn't have the future we want, right? You know, what happened to the future? And now we're moving back from this peak of the mountain. And actually, yeah. the future is further for us. The, the idea of the future is further for us every year. So my question is like, you are you have some people saying we need poetry, maybe we need science fiction. How we can build a, a future that's that 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 gives us the envy to go, and that's not the future we we want to. Uh, that this is it's proposed to us. This is a difficult question. Uh, the one of the things also I think is actually this focus on the future. So why should we always be focusing on the future? I get that we should be making some plans uh, that make sense. Uh, but the question is also what do we want to build today? Uh, what kind of future do we want to have? And that's the way you open new roads. So always trying to project yourself, it's very difficult to be acting today. What we're doing with Derive is just opening this door saying we're sick of having this automated itinerary from point A to point B. We love getting lost. We love the poetry of our city. So let's build something to, for now, be able to live the way we want. And maybe this will lead to a specific future. So I, my answer would be, would be that. Uh, the grand plans are complicated uh, to, to, to play with. So let's try to make small plans, try new things, uh, be less, um, how do you say, um, uh, be less uh, hard on ourselves uh, and and just try to play a little bit and 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 recreate uh, pleasures. Yeah. We have a question for Marcus. What's the place of social sciences in your view of innovation? What's the perfect team following your view of innovation? And I know your collective has quite a different skills. It's yeah. So I, I I didn't get the question. If you can. No, sorry. The question is, what's the place of social science? Do you only yeah. have ten people, or do you have other people in in the collective? We don't have uh, uh, people specialize in social science uh, for now in the collective. We work with a lot of uh, social scientists uh, in, in different fields, or we basically read uh, what they're saying. But this is uh, obviously a perfect subject for social scientists, and it's been, it's been uh, uh, tackled uh, by them a lot. And um, that's the whole point. I mean, uh, you can attack or deconstruct this dogma from very different perspectives. Just for the economic perspective, uh, there are a lot of economists that, that challenge the productivity that, uh, that was supposed uh, to come from this digitization. You have the social scientists that can challenge them. You have the anthropologist that, that can look at the human practices and challenge this dogma. So from all sides, uh, you can come and elaborate on this reflection and try to figure out uh, what part of it is dogma and what part of it is uh, actually something that we can prove and that makes actually our, our, our uh, societies better. Yeah, uh, you know, Charles Seaman wrote a book called Wizard versus Prophets. He said in society, you have either the wizards, people who want to drive everything with technology, right? Like magic or technology, yeah. right? And we have the prophets, people, we need to change ourselves. It's not, we will not solve all the problem with technology, you know. So do you, what do we need today? Do we have too much wizards? Do we need more prophets? Do we have enough prophets? Like, where do you see it coming, right? Wizard versus I, prophets. I would say we need more kids. We need more people that, that just want to play. Uh, and that's where it all will come from. Yeah, I, I love I love this uh, this answer. If you have really thirty seconds, uh, two questions: Do you see yourself as a humanist versus the text New Good, New Gods? My, no, do I see no, myself? No, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess so. Yeah. So, is it? Uh, uh, someone is asking: Is it a new fork for Tech for Good, or a Tech for Good mental health? Uh, tech for good is, is something that is, uh, to me, tech for good, what they're trying to do is basically take the same dogma and apply it to other subjects. So basically, because it's applied to other subjects, it's better, or I, I guess. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, we need to dig deeper. Uh, and it's not tech for good, it's good tech, I guess. Uh, it's, it's another way to see it. We need to go back deep to the roots, to the ideologies, and start from scratch 
and not just try to take the same framework and say, all right, it's not just to make money, it's also to help people because the problems that are generated by the model will be the same in all types of use cases. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I think we reached uh, uh, our time, but it was, I think, really inspiring. You have already some people in the chat who, who really thank you uh, uh, for, for this presentation. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, yeah, and again, don't hesitate to share in the link. You can go to the Deriv app or the 99 contents, uh, right? If you want just to uh, discover uh, uh, restaurants, you know, and have this adventure into into your food uh, journey. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank we you. can.